So, first of all, I have to give many thanks to the organizer of the event for giving me the opportunity to be here, sharing with you some of my, some of my thoughts on, uh, on the current technology that supports uh, open educational resources initiatives, but, uh, much more, but what is much more important for me to try to figure out how this technology could evolve in the coming years. Uh, so, um, before starting, uh, I have to tell you that most of the things that I will speak in my, in my talk should be classified as uh, phase two uh, issues, uh, taking the definition of Sydney, because um, in my view, there is a lot of technologies that can be used just today uh, for improving a lot the functionality and the, the way the resources can be semantically described. But the thing is that uh, we need a lot, we should need a lot of, uh, to spend a lot of effort in doing, in doing this right now. So I think that we are now in the face of simply emphasizing the sharing of resources, just uh, as in the excellent initiative you have uh, learned about in this uh, today and yesterday. But uh, I want to emphasize the role of what could, what could come in the coming years, okay? And uh, also I have to tell you that I'm, I am a computer scientist and my background is on uh, knowledge representation, ontologies and uh, all this technical stuff. So uh, please, if, some, if something is not easily understandable, uh, please uh, just interrupt me and I can expand uh, on my presentation, okay? So the outline of the presentation is this. First, I will take a definition of open educational resource, and I will try to make my own interpretation of openness from the viewpoint of a technologist. Uh, then from this, I will uh, jump to a list of technical requirements, my own list of technical requirements for the coming years. Uh, of course, that uh, for me, it is critical to point out that uh, open educational resources can benefit from the research that's, that has been done in the last years in what is called the learning object research, which is something like a fuzzy term, but uh, in fact many, many initiatives and many uh, software libraries are uh, available today that can help us in uh, developing advanced open educational resource initiatives. Then I will go to a review of some technical challenges and uh, I will finish with a brief uh, discussion of uh, how are we approaching open courseware in my university. Uh, of course that my university is a really a small one and we have very few, ch very few uh, chances to, to get bigger because uh, just in the small surrounding area of the city of Madrid we have uh, seven public universities and six private ones so it's difficult to get bigger and of course this will always always be a small open courseware initiative. This is why we, our plan is to focus on uh, developing more technologically, adv technologically advanced tools that can of course benefit not only from the contents developed by our staff but also from other contents that are yet really available from, from other initiatives. So we focus uh, concretely on technology and this is our uh, let's say uh, our value proposition for this uh, um, open courseware world. So, coming to to our first definition, I have simply uh, put here a popular definition for open educational resources. And uh, okay, you have here that these are digital, digital, digitized materials offered freely and openly for educators, students, and self learners to use and use for teaching, learning and research, okay. Uh, here we have to point to some critical things. First is that materials covers different granularities. So a materials could be very small or could be something of a higher granularity like a course. And for example in MIT they take the course of, as the unit of production. While for example in connections the unit of production is in many cases as I have uh, as I have checked yesterday, is very, very small. It is very small fragments. So all of them are open educational resources, but they are different in granularity. 
And of course, uh, there is a difference in elaboration. Uh, a course is something that has been planned, that is uh, probably um, adapted to some international curricular recommendations, while some other contents are really informal. This is something, uh, let's say, a blog post or something like that, uh, which has a different form and a different effort behind it. And uh, one thing that it is not often raised in these kind of discussions, is that uh, open educational resources cover things that are not targeted to final learners or are not targeted even to teachers. Because this also covers empirical data about how the teaching, uh, some teaching experience has, has, uh, has functioned, uh, could also include the design, the, that is the rational, the thinking behind the design of a concrete learning experience. And this is just sharing another kind of things. This is not the final product, but uh, uh, this is sharing our knowledge about the design of, of, of these uh, learning resources of, of, or of these learning experiences. And I, I would like to emphasize a lot this second aspect of open educational resources. Uh, other important thing is how open should be interpreted, and I don't want to give a final <laughs> statement about this, but I will give some of my ideas about this. Uh, I use the term open in two, in two senses. One is, okay, open is providing access to non-obfuscated sources. For example, if you put a flash course, if you want this to be open, you have to put something that is editable and not the final product. And uh, from that viewpoint, it is much better if you put uh, uh, some open format than a proprietary format. So this is a way of understanding openness. But uh, a second sense is that open means usable and accessible in general. So, okay, the resource, the resource is, is, is shared, but if uh, we want people to be able to find it, if we want people to be able to effectively find it, then we need to put technology that mediates between the, learn, the, the needs of the learners and the right contents for the concrete learning needs. And uh, today we have a number of uh, open courseware initiatives, but let's imagine that in the future this increases in volume then we will have the same problem of information overload we have today with the web. We will have the same for open resources. And if we, have not, if we did not make an effort in putting mediating technology, then we will end up with many resources, but no means to select the right ones. And this is my emphasis in, in research. Okay. So expanding a little bit with uh, that of providing resources, the sources are really important to translate, improve, or adapt the resources, okay? And from that viewpoint, the granularity of the, of the resources is important, and uh, some techniques could be developed to increase the um, translatability, the uh, adaptability of resources. And very easy things, very, really, very, very easy things. In addition to to the sources, it is important that the, the resources have good documentation, a clean and understandable design, hints for adapting the content. Okay? If you have developed something, some complex simulation in Flash, for example, and, and somebody wants to go into the code and try to modify it, then this is a software engineering problem. If this has not a good documentation, has, it has not been designed in a clean way, as computer scientists uh, are supposed to, to know how to do it, then this is not open at all, okay? even, even though it is provided for free. And I guess that this should be an important quality criteria that is often not considered in, in open educational resources. And uh, for me, I, I guess that is, if we don't emphasize this, uh, these points, we could have something similar to the software crisis that is, uh, for those of you that are not computer scientists, the software crisis is a term that refers uh, to the fact that uh, in software development, the, the largest 
amount of uh, research of, of uh, development effort goes to maintenance, that is to changing the software, to adapting the software, and not to developing it. And uh, yesterday, Sydney gave, gave us some impression of uh, how many new contents are created and how often uh, they are modified. And it is likely that modification will be more frequent than new creations. So we have to uh, critically think on uh, how modifi uh, modifiability should be a quality criteria also for open educational resources. So, just a very simple example. This is something that is a little bit uh, uh, silly, but uh, can um, give a, 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 an image of, uh, of how with the very simple techniques we can increase the adaptability of uh, a given learning resource. And uh, here I will, I will show you a small example I did some years ago in which I use uh, CSS styles just to mark the parts that, that are domain dependent. But this is something silly, but I guess that uh, this could be interesting for some people. And here you have a resource that is, uh, I made available some time ago, and it's uh, about the wideband Delphi technique, which is a consensus reaching uh, technique uh, often used in economics and in project planning in general. Okay, this wideband Delphi technique. Uh, or this resource was for my computer science students, so this is for software development. Uh, then many of the parts of this, re this resource are specific to the field of computer science, so that this cannot be reused directly for economics, for example. But I know, I, as a designer of the, of the resource, I clearly know which parts are specific of my domain. And the thing I did is simply put in a uh, a CSS class called problem specific that marks this part that should be changed when you are changing the main so that other people can come reuse the template of the of my uh, of my uh, content and then change the parts that are specific to, to my domain this is fairly simple but this really increases reusability okay so Going back to openness, uh, I, I want here to emphasize the role of design. Openness, of course, means different things for different domains. And uh, one of the, the examples I, I like more is this open source beer called Boris All, in which the ingredients and the formula and the brewing techniques are open so that can, people can contribute to make it better. Okay? And here, the, we are not sharing the final products because the beer, you have to pay for the beer, okay? This is difficult to make beer free, but perhaps governments should, should think about this. But uh, uh, the thing is that this is an example of sharing the design of the product. The important is to share the design, okay? And what if we translate this to OER? Mm, okay, open education is now open educational resources emphasize sharing the final product, but not the design. And we should think on how to share the learning design, how to share usage data for the resource, how to share the learning context that were the motivating, uh, um, the, motivating the region of, of creating this resource, and of course, what about the assessment of outcomes. So I guess that we have in the future, or right now, we have to make a shift to sharing more on the design of the learning resources. So, but we, we, we can wonder, but is, is design not shared today? So for example, if you take this example of the MIT Open Courseware, okay, here when, uh, when you have this uh, session schedule with uh, this classification of lectures, quizzes, and project sessions, this is something like sharing a part of the design, so that this is the final design of the, of, of the learning experience. And you can reuse this. You can reuse this and not the contents. Okay? So, to some extent, some initiatives are actually um, reusing part of the design or putting or sharing part of the design. But this is, of course, in a format that is specific for MIT. 
is there any chance to put this in a common format? And my answer is yes, it is really. And it is called IMS Learning Design. No? Irrespective of uh, what we think about the level of maturity of IMS Learning Design or, or its complexity or, or the provision of appropriate tools, it is clear that IMS Learning Design provides a way of expressing uh, sequences of, acti of learning activities almost any imaginable sequence of activities. So, for example, this is just another resource I put some time ago, and it's again about the Delphi technique, and you have a typical sequence of activities. Okay, for those of you that do, are not knowledgeable, uh, don't know about IMS learning design, uh, this is a typical arrangement of uh, uh, sequential activities, and you have to define in each activity uh, which roles are are taking part in this activity and which learning objects will be shown to which role in which activity. So it's a very fine-grained description of, of what is supposed to happen in the classroom or in the virtual classroom, okay? <laughs> so why not sharing learning design instead of that? So technology is really, and this is uh, much in processable, okay? And we can make so it, very interesting queries as for example, please give me open designs that after each content have an assessment activity and you can issue this query to a specialized query engine and you can do this in Google okay, this is the idea of putting more formality on the way we describe things so I also want to bring here a reflection of on how are we today sharing design descriptions? Because, for example, in my in my discipline, uh, in computer science, this is regularly done in journals as I try to lead transactions on education, okay? in journal of information system education, etc., etc. So, the regular and the traditional peer review process is yet working to publish high quality, or supposedly high quality, learning design, learning experiences, and in some cases, even the content. This is in the traditional way. The problem is that, again, it is difficult to find them, because you have to go to the, to go to the sources, and uh, you have to check the table of content of the journal, or something like that. But this is already done, and this is something that we have to think about when we start to mention renewing or changing the peer review process, okay? Because uh, something is working yet. So coming back to the second definition, I will expand more on this definition of open as accessible and usable. And uh, accessible and usable can be interpreted in several, way, in several ways. For example, some aspects include our universal design that is often overlooked in <laughs> open courseware initiatives. Okay, as, you, as all of you know, there are guidelines for making the content more accessible for disabled people, for elderly people, etc. And this is just another technical criteria. Okay, this is, uh, there, there, is, there is available technology to check this. Of course, cross-browser and cross-platform compatibility and standards compliance. Because uh, if we are thinking, for example, in developing a new site, a new technology, a new system, just to compose some uh, existing contents into a into a structure and provide it with different organizations, then this is a score. This is an existing standard. So the functionality is provided by the standard. And it is much better if we reuse this standard simply because we will have more tools available. This is something for, this is for a practical purpose. So, so before starting to think on a clever XML structure for open resources, it is better to first try to try to find if this is covered by existing by existing standards. Okay, and it's amazing uh, the complexity of, for example, of IDL SCORM with regards to personalization is really amazing. This is why when people speak about personalization in e-learning. The first question should be, but isn't that support by SCORM? Because probably you are reinventing the wheel, okay? Because the level is so high from the technological viewpoint. 
So, okay, probably for me one of the most important aspects is findability vision Google. Okay, this is the critical point, findability vision Google. And for me, metadata is the key for, the key for findability for some given learning needs. For example, Okay, first of all, a criticism of Google, as you probably know, the page rank really doesn't care about the text inside your page, but cares about the links that the text of the links that points to your help, to, to your page. So if we rely on this technology for learning resources, we will have Google bombing again. Okay? So I think that we should re, re, uh, put this in a second place, put this technology in a second place. And I would like to see in the future queries like this. For example, I need interactive learning objects with group activities to teach consensus reaching methods. And this can be done with current technology. And of course, with that expensive in, in providing the tool, or with an, uh, uh, a big spending in, in writing the tools. Or for example, I am looking for reflective contents about relevant historical events during the lifespan of Adam Smith, etc. This is the this is really providing openness to learning resources because you can express in a very detailed way not only the, the topics of what you are looking for, but also the pedagogical properties you want to see in the, in the learning resources. Okay? And this can be done. So, this has been my discussion of what is my landscape, my... Uh, my idea of openness uh, with regards to technology. Now I will go to some technical requirements. And first of all, I have to say that from a technical perspective, uh, in <coughs> starting an open courseware uh, initiative is not challenging from a technical viewpoint. Because uh, you have, for example, uh, this Edu Commons platform is perfectly usable, it's easy to install, and in, in the volume and activity load of many of these initiatives is not challenging from a computer science, computer science uh, scientist viewpoint. So, I guess that for the first phase, um, uh, first phase projects, it is there is not there are not relevant technical challenges. Okay, some people will say that uh, something else should be done with licenses. <laughs> But I am not an expert on that. I just point out, point out here that you have this open digital rights language that probably could be uh, used to to give a more, more standard form of, of this, all these uh, share-alike licenses. Okay, so this is not challenging. The basic part is not challenging. But what we could be needed to provide something more advanced? All of the above, of course. Of course, we are we are not throwing out all the investment in, in system for, for open resources, but extend them in the following direction. An emphasis on reusability, an emphasis on providing more on the design rationale of the learning resources, technologies for the federation, translation and aggregation of repositories, technologies for filtering according to the context targeted and the quality for those contexts, and richer metadata schemas, and here is where ontologies can, can give some added value. Okay, I, will, I will try to speak a little bit about all of these points, just to give some hint of what can be done today. So, first, reusability is about learning objects, and from this technological perspective, the definition of learning objects is really clear. It is not any of the uh, it is not the first, the second, the third, or the fourth one. It's the fifth one. Okay, this is the, a compilation of definition from uh, coming from Madrid. But the definition we should add there from a technological viewpoint is the last one. It is digital object marked in a specific, very specific ways for educational purposes. Okay, and uh, some time ago I put these definitions into a in a picture okay, that is this Venn diagram and. Uh, I, w I only care about of this inner set of resources, okay? And typical open courseware is located, is part of typical open courseware are in this category, but other, other is not. And we have to try to make all open courseware to be um, in the set of uh, things specific marked mark up with uh, uh, technical languages 
that they specify educational properties. So this is my view, of, uh, which are the difference between learning objects and open educational resources. So another thing that I want to raise here is that there has been a, a, a debate in the granularity and the reusability of learning objects. Okay? Uh, most typical open educational resources are courseware of high granularity. And in this diagram I have put this axis in which you have the amount, of amount and quality of metadata and the granularity of the, of the resources. And the, the most reusable learning resources are located just in the uh, just above. They have high quality metadata and uh, moderate granularity. Okay, but courseware is mostly in in the other in the other part. It is of high granularity, and they often do not have a lot of metadata, or it is really informal or not well structured. And this is, of course, due to the CARS mindset of the university. And this is something I think that should change to improve openness. Okay? But this is not completely true, because, for example, in connections, you have good examples of the, of the opposite. This is, for example, uh, a material from connections that is measures of central tendency. And this is a typical size of learning object. Could be divided a little bit more, but okay, this is typically a learning object. So I guess that in connection there is a non-explicit mm, uh, conception of low granularity learning objects. I guess I don't I don't I don't know if this is, is purposeful or or is casual. Okay. So for me, emphasizing reachability is a matter of structure and design. Is that that fostering people to break their content, break their resources into a smaller pieces that have sense by themselves. And here I want to introduce you briefly this, uh, um, the notion of reusability and usability. First, usability uh, has been defined by first knives, the ability of learning object to support or, or enable a very particular and concrete cognitive goal, a very particular and concrete learning need. Okay? This can be defined as the usability of learning object. Okay? And reusability then becomes the degree a learning object is usable in several declared learning contexts. So, if you want to address more context, you have to the, the, the design of the learning objects because becomes more challenging because you have to think on many different learners. Okay, and this can be put in the design of the learning object, but this is an extra effort, of course. So. Mm. So re reusability is something that can be purposefully put in the design of OER, and this is why, uh, personally, I emphasize a lot in educating people in Spain now, okay, about learning object technology, learning object standards, providing courses. Now we have a master course in learning technology. They have a full uh, 12 credit, 12 European credit subject that is only about the standards, learning object technology, repositories, etc. So that people that uh, is being educated in learning technology really have the technical knowledge to innovate in these kind of issues. And uh, so, please think about this uh, strange formula I published some time ago. Uh, this is only this is only to express an abstract concept. This is not a mathematical formula. Okay. So the thing is that reusability depends in the number of contexts you address, so that if you are addressing more context, of course, that your object will be more usable, okay? And, uh, but the problem is that you, you have the risk that, that your learning object become, becomes not so usable for some of the context. So you have to make a trade-off, okay? And this formula try to, try to uh, put this in formal terms, okay? So... The question is, from my viewpoint, is should reusability be rewarded in itself? Not reuse, but the reusability, because reuse is empirical facts. How many people have reused? But reusability is something in the design. And should we reward, should we emphasize reusability? I, I think that we should, okay? because then this makes uh, resources more open. Okay. Mm. 
Now I want to show you another silly example on how to change the instructional design mindset to a reusability context. Okay? Uh, and for me, the K issue here is defining the learning profiles. Okay? The learner profiles. Learner profiles are grouping mechanisms for needs. So a learner profile is a given need, something so, so similar, a given learning need. And uh, one thing that is important is that the definition of the, of the learner profile is also reusable and could be put as an open educational resource and could be very, very useful because we, we could structure the access to the, to the contents by some typical uh, learner profiles. And this is also something that is easy. It's not technically challenging. Okay. So, going back to my example, some time ago I started to try to learn about tasting whiskey, okay, which is uh, something that everybody has to face in one point in life. And uh, then I started to, de to define some of the learner profiles for whiskey, and that they are really diverging because you have, for example, whiskey producers, whiskey dealers, whiskey consumers, whiskey tasters, whiskey addicts, which is something really different whiskey historians, etc. And you can imagine all of these learning profiles with different needs for their business, for their uh, pleasure, or for, other, for their health, or something like that. Then, if you go to design, uh, okay, I have made this exercise and I have some learning object on whiskey, but they have not checked by a whiskey expert still. And uh, the thing is that you can start saying, okay, a learning need could be I want to learn on the facts of, on the evolution of whiskey prices, okay? Or I want to learn knowledge on the geography and varieties of whiskey, or, or I want to learn, etc., etc. These are fine-grained learning needs. And you can relate these learning needs to the profile. So, for example, knowledge on the geography and varieties is important for whiskey dealers, but also for whiskey historians and probably to other profiles. And, uh, okay, you can make this network of uh, this profile requires this, this profile requires that, etc. And then you can start your, the development of the resources by going to the learning needs that cross-cut most learning profiles, which, here, which are uh, probably the more reusable pieces, the more important, because more learning needs would probably need it. And this is a small change in instructional design, okay? And this can be teach in instructional design modules very easily. And you can develop your own examples and things like that. And this changes the mind to thinking on, not on my students of my course in my university, but to many people that could need, uh, could make use of your resource, okay? So, mm, go, let's go to the second to the second technical issue is sharing open design. As I have told you yet that IMS Learning Design is an open language for recording activity-based designs. And this specifies the basic elements, objectives, arrangement of activities, etc. Allows the, the automated distribution of activities through the web and allows, and this is very important, the automatic recording of activity execution really prepared for meta-analysis or social network analysis. So this is an added value, and this would provide probably in the future a chance to have large databases of actual usage in a common language, actual use of learning activities. And this is good for science, simply for science. Perhaps it is not important for the final learner, let's say, but this is important for researchers, for pedagogists, and for all of us that are worried about the best and more efficient techniques for, uh, for education. The problem with learning design is that it does not inform on the design rationale. That is, we have the product of the design, but again, we don't have the hints of the intellectual process of designing this, uh, these activities. Okay, this is, a, this is only a picture of the model of learning design, and I only wanted to point to you that there is a box called learning object right there, okay, in a corner. <laughs> so, discovers learning objects, but it's something activity-oriented, okay? Uh, going back to the rational, to the, to the rational. IEEE long has an educational category, but does not inform much on the pedagogical approach, okay? Interactivity type, or 
learner, typical age case, okay, it's okay, but much more can be done really easily. For example, this is a, a classification from Conol et al. This is a classification of learning resources in three axes. Okay, it's individual, social, uh, reflective, non reflective, non reflective, and information and experience. Okay, this probably makes sense for pedagogists, not, not so much sense for me, but, <laughs> but okay, I, th I think this makes sense for them. Uh, why can't we tag our, our digital resources with this axis? Okay, because this provides a really useful information on, uh, on uh, the theoretical position the, that the creator of the resource had when it was designed in the course. And this is highly valuable because we can reuse the know-how of the best um, teachers or of the best instructional designers in the world. Okay? So, for example, here you have these phases of uh, reflective, le reflective learning from Dewey. And why can we try to make technology in which you can query for give me resources that follow the reflective learning approach of Dewey? Why not? It can be done, okay? And this is what I mean by pedagogical annotation, something that it is still undeveloped, but that can be done, okay? So, okay, the benefits of sharing open designs in this manner are multiple, and I have put here some of them. Of course, they enable the linking of the theoretical assumptions on pedagogy to practical learning design, by themselves are useful resources for education and training, so, because a, a, a student studying pedagogy or instructional design can simply see the examples of, of the experts. Uh, perhaps this may eventually lead to finding patterns, in, uh, so that courses that follow this pattern of activity work better than the other, could be eventually. And uh, this, also, this also serves for detailed comparison between the effectiveness and adequacy of learning designs. In my, pers in my personal experience, in working with uh, people coming from pedagogy, I have found as much definition of what a constructive, constructivist design is as persons. And it is very difficult for them to, to tell in let's say, in, the, in terms that can be formalized in, in computer languages, what differentiates, really differentiates, a constructivist, a constructivist or a socio-cultural design or whatever other position on, on developing resources, okay? And this is an area that uh, we should explore from the viewpoint of making more open the resources. So let's turn to architectural issues. Architecture for me in the coming years is going from single sites to federated, to federated sites and to brokers. Okay? But the thing is that standards and technology are yet ready. Okay? We have standards for data interchange, we have ITRI Polylon, we have Dublin Core and many others. Recently you have this SQI that is, is a Query language is specific to either polylone, so this is yet prepared for, for, for developing federations of learning audit repositories. And of course, we have many supporting, open supporting technologies, like, like for example, business process execution language that can easily automate the gathering of uh, resources from other repositories, or distributing queries, translating queries, pre-processing queries, etc. This is yet really, and we have some templates. If you want to make something technological about this, we have templates on BPEL, for example, that you can use. And of course, you have web services and semantic web services, but this is established technology. This is not a, I guess, not a problem. And uh, of course, here queries will be distributed, which enables the physical separation of repositories. Okay? I don't want to enter into details of uh, architectural details, but uh, very few people know about this IMS DRI specification. From my viewpoint, it's not a mat mature and good specification right now, but they are trying to put together <coughs> some other work into a single standard. So something is, is being done in standardizing this federation thing. 
Okay, for me, it's not a good specification. Okay, but it is good to sh to to know that uh, this is available. Uh, let's go for the fourth point: is filter and quality. The first thing that is usually raised in this content is collaborative filtering. Okay, collaborative filtering is the technology used by Amazon. When you enter in Amazon and you provide rating for the books you have bought, then Amazon will give you uh, examples of other books that probably you would like. Okay, and this is an old computer science algorithm and has some open open source implementation. Okay, not so efficient, but uh, but they really work. Uh, of course, the problem with this is that it requires a large populated database of rating, so that this systems suffer of the latency problem, uh, problem because they need to start re collecting ratings for some time before they can start to make recommendations. But this is established technology, okay? And I prefer this to uh, quality certifications to some extent because this is personalization. This, is, this resource is good for you, but this is not to say that this is the best resource in the world. This is good for you and for this other person, but perhaps it's not so good for the other. So we are not going to annoy anybody with this kind of technology. Okay. Mm. The problem is that for open educational recording, we need to ratings are not uh, are not enough. I guess that we need at least a rating for each resource context pair. Okay, because this resource could be good for this context or for this learning thing, but could be very bad for this other context. Okay, so we have to extend <coughs> this paradigm to pairs of uh, resource context. Okay, but this is really we can use. The second uh, popular thing is ranking. Okay, ranking in classical academic version is the peer review. Okay. And it is also something that is being done in Merlot, for example, it's classical peer review, and this has its problems. And uh, we have also these formal citation indexes. Okay? In the web version, we have Google PageRank, that is actually working but has many flaws. Okay? Because uh, ranking increases with incoming links from other ranked pages. And uh, people can also be ranked easily by duplicating this, this algorithm and we had a paper on that with a people rank that is simply duplicating the page rank. So it's nothing new, it's simply applying it two times. Okay? But the, for open educational resources we need some changes. First is that the links should be considered equal to usages of open educational resources. This is not only that I put a link to the resource because it can be easily used for bombing, okay? It is much better that we uh, use, instead of links, certified positive usage of this resource. That is, in my institution, in this course, I certify, as, uh, as a member of this institution, that we positively use this, uh, this resource. And it works. It works. Okay? And this is really a, a, a very nice thing to do because uh, it fosters that uh, people try to help others in using their in using their their resources because they will go into the uh, they will go higher into in the rank. Okay, this is a form of um, promoting people that uh, really provides good uh, good resources. And the problem is that the page in the original page run should be substituted, not by, the, by a page, but by an institution or perhaps a person, perhaps a person, or a position, you know, or a department, or something like that. So with these two, two changes and the appropriate mechanism to collect the information, we can have a version of page rank with uh, no possibilities for bombing, okay? and that could work effectively for, for, for this uh, domain of, of openness, okay? So, very quickly, because I'm, I, I guess I'm out of time, okay, no? Yeah. Okay, very quickly, just to give you some hints on richer metadata and ontologies, okay? Just with an example, here you have Merlot, and you have a learning object about the Song Dynasty in China. 
and you have some pieces of metadata here, clearly, okay? So, languages for metadata. One is natural language, you have it there. It is described in natural language, and it is good for Yahoo search or conventional search engines. If you put this in LOM, you have to find the field that should be used for this concrete information, and you will find that this should be put in coverage. So you have to say long general coverage and put the string there, okay? But you can go a step further and say something like, okay, I will represent the learning object as an instance in an ontology, and I will put some formal predicates describing this learning object. And this looks something similar to the things above, but they are radically different, and I will try to explain quickly. If we say that learning object one coverage is China, and China is recognized, is known, is known by the ontology, is known, is formally represented in the ontology as an independent country, then the software, the machines, know that the geographical boundaries of political entities, so that you can make queries like find learning object of countries around China, <laughs> okay? And for example, this kind of knowledge is really available today. Yes, it is. And it is available in open form. Because you have this amazing initiative called OpenPsych. Okay, and all of this is codified. You have the libraries. And it is not so difficult to start, for example, this, solving these kind of queries of around. It is something like two or three pages of code for a computer science student. So we are not speaking about uh, futuristic things, but things that can be done with uh, a little thought. Okay? And for example, for coverage in historic periods, you, can, you could uh, search for countries fighting China, China during the Song Dynasty. Okay? This could be interesting. Okay, so all this opens many possibilities for a specialized search. Okay? But we don't need to discard existing software for uh, for open educational resources. They will uh, still exist, but this will go in another layer, okay? Um, but we have to find people and ways of uh, putting effort in developing these formal, uh, these formal things so that it is more easy to, to find the open resources, okay? So I will skip this. And then as a summary, I have tried to, to put together some of the Abilities that I have mentioned during the presentation, and you have, for example, this maintainability, adaptability of customization, findability related to metadata, transportability related to standards, reusability versus usability, okay, exposure of the design and the design rationale, how much information we provide on the design, and machine readability or formality of the metadata. This is a set of technical quality criteria that could be fully developed uh, to foster people to uh, spend effort in this. And of course, you need some incentives. And uh, why, why could not develop instruments and scales specific to open educational resources? Just, just as we have this LORI, this learning object review instrument, that is simply a questionnaire that has been scientifically validated, okay? Why can we make just another questionnaire for te technical quality of an open educational resource? So that this is something uh, scientifically sound, and you can say, hey, my, my, my resource has this uh, point in this scale. Okay? This could be uh, good as an incentive. Okay? And of course, we need to connect this, in this with uh, incentive, incentive for instructors for sustainability, but this is not my topic. So I will not tell more about this. So I have told you most of uh, what I wanted to communicate, but the thing is that I only want to tell some things about our concrete initiative for my small university, on also OCW. And uh, now we have installed this EduCommons software. Okay, the, tech, the staff of the, tech, of the tech computer school uh, has this installed, and this is hosting now uh, materials that were yet existing and yet and they were yet open because they were they were shared through an FTP server, which is some form of low-end technology for open educational resources. So this is a, simply a matter of translating. But this is 
but the amount of resources is very small and will continue to be small. Okay? And the thing is that we are focusing now on delivering the, the technology we are developing in the LUISA project, which is an European project in which the Open University is also participating. And the, the thing is that LUISA, LUISA technology, will be the semantic mediation to a conventional repository. So no need to change any commons or any other software, but we only separate the formal metadata to another layer. This is the approach. And uh, just like, as a curiosity, we, we are funding this through our MSc degree on, on uh, educational technology, uh, voluntary recognized as service, and we emphasize a lot on teacher education in design for usability. Okay, this is very, very important for us. And I guess that this would be very important for this our initiative to, to succeed. Okay, I will finish because I am out of I am out of time. And I, here you have some questions for the discussion. And uh, if you want.